You're listening to At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. One of the things we like to do here at At The Mic is bring you some of the folks from behind the scenes at places like the Blaze TV. And a guy who has a thankless job around here of making sure that the TV audience gets their beloved shows delivered in a timely manner is a guy named Clayton Kimbrough. Clayton sat down and talked about working at a golf course, life as a sports mascot, and whatever happened to the Spoons artwork that he made in honor of Jeffy back in the Pat and Stu days. We get things started right now on At The Mic. Clayton Kimbrough, one of my coworkers here at The Blaze, before it's all said and done, I will charge you for this therapy session because that's what this is going to end up being. Is that cool with you? Do you take copay? Uh, it depends. Who's your insurance? Uh, the same as yours, Keith. Oh, no, I only take cash. I'm oh, okay. sorry. Okay, so first of all, please explain to me what exactly you do here because I know you're in the video department, okay? That I know. I also know that when I have a question about anything, you're the guy I come to because you know all, but I don't, I don't specifically know what, uh, what, what all you do down there in your cave. So my title is media services manager. Okay. What that means is um, I have no idea. Sounds important though. Oh my gosh, so important. Right? Um, media. Basically, anything that has to do with a video product on our platform, on social, um, any type of delivery, my team handles. Uh-huh. Um, that means like stuff you see on YouTube gets cut by us okay. and uploaded. Yeah. Uh, stuff you see on the platform, the shows that people are watching right now on Blaze TV, those all come through my department. Okay, so so people answer to you then? Not really. Oh, listen to him downplay. People ask school. me a lot of questions about things that I might know answers to mm-hmm. just because I've been here almost seven years, which wow. is pretty old in media ops. World. Yeah, yeah, that's so, cool. Um, is it a high-stress job down there? or uh, It can be. It fun? It can be. The best thing about it is is um, just we're a, a really tight-knit team. Mm-hmm. I've worked with everybody there about seven years, pretty much. I worked with Kyra, my other editor, before. Okay. So we, we all have a long history together, so we all kind of know how each other works. We know weaknesses and mm. and uh, strengths. So we, we really balance out and make a really good team. Are you from Texas originally? Yeah. Um, okay, but not Dallas-Fort Worth. No. Where we live here. You were born in Abilene, correct? Abilene, Texas. Okay. So how long did you live there? I think I was two or three, and then we moved to Arlington. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So you've basically grown up in the Dallas. Yeah, I grew up I grew, I've grown up in Irving for most of my uh, you know, remembering childhood, I guess. I got you. And the, yeah, so but Abil- I always call Abilene home just because um it's where my family's from. It's it's where our history is, uh-huh. and I've spent a lot of time there. Um, I worked there after college, so you know it, it's always had a deep hold on me. Tell us uh, a fun fact about Abilene, Texas, that people should know that probably don't know. What's the coolest thing besides you? I mean, besides you, that has come Stop. out of Abilene? Jason Buttrell. Really? <laughs> he's he's from there too. Yeah, he's from Abilene. Um, it's nice. funny when I found that out, I was like. Really? And he actually knows some of my cousins, and, you know, that's that's the kind of thing. It's not a big town, but it's mm-hmm. not a small town. Yeah, so, no, it's a town you hear about. Yeah, yeah. so it it has that small town feel, though, because mm-hmm. everyone's real tight-knit. But um, How big is it? How, how many people live there? Um, when name? I was born, it was, like, around 100,000, but I think it's, like, 120, uh, okay. 130 now. Yeah. Good, good. There's an Air Force base there, so, you know, that's that's always been a major part of the population. It's just slowly grown. Did you grow up in Arlington then? Is that where you went to school and everything? I grew up in Irving. I lived in uh, the south side of town. Oh. Um, well, you did say Arlington earlier, Well, right? that's where we moved. moved we to, moved okay. from Abilene just, to Arlington gotcha, gotcha. Uh, with my grandparents before we got a house and everything. Okay. Irving. Well, where'd you go to high school? Because there's a fun fact that I can't wait to talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> I went to uh, high school at MacArthur High School, which is right up the street here. Okay. I literally grew up about two miles from the studio. Oh, my gosh. So junior high and high school, I lived on this side of town. What what is the mascot of MacArthur High School? Uh, It is a cardinal. It's a cardinal. Named Victor. Okay, because uh, one of the fun facts about you is that you were your high school's mascot, right? Your senior year? 
So were you the MacArthur High Cardinal then? I was Victor the Cardinal. Oh my goodness. That is awesome. Did you have fun with that? Oh yeah, it's it's great because it's like um you're in just like a different world. Yeah. Like you don't you don't think about anything. Like you just do whatever you want. Like anything you want, you just do it, you know, cuz it's like there's no oh these people are going to look at me weird. No, right. no, I'm in a cardinal suit. But did 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 your friends and your fellow students did they know that was you in there? Oh yeah, yeah. They did. So okay. we had we had a bunch of spirit groups. We had a group called Fire Truck Crew, which okay. was kind of like the crazy zany spirit group thing. And I saw it as like, all right, I could be a part of that team. Or I could stand out on my own as the mascot. Uh-huh. So I went the mascot route. And uh, funny story about that, I did a Chris Farley skit, uh, the motivational speaker. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, that, that was my skit to uh-huh. uh, to interview to be the Cardinal. And I took a <laughs> steel chair to the face oh, to, no. uh, to fully sell it. Did, so. Wait, did... Who applied the, the the chair? Was it yourself? Oh uh, no, it was it was a friend of mine. So you trusted this person? Oh yeah, yeah. I've taken a chair to the face a couple times. Okay, all right. I, I is there videotape of that? Because I kind of want to see this. No, this was before smartphones and all that newfangled technology. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. I want you to give us a give us a line. Just do something from Matt Foley, right? That's the character yeah. from Saturday Night Live. Chris Farley's character, Matt Foley. So give us something from that awesome. Are you talking about the scene where, you know, he's, I think on the couch is David Spade, Christina Applegate. Uh, so they're, they're the kids, right? Phil Hartman is the mm-hmm. dad, and he has him come over. Is that the same deal you did there? Pretty much. I kind of adapted it to a football coach <laughs> okay. just because it was, you know, it was around football season. That's that's when the mascot was used most, so I just kind of adapted around that. I don't know if my voice will let me do it today. Oh, yeah. You know what? We'll revisit this because yeah. you are such a trooper doing this today because your voice is failing you. And uh, and I asked you, I said, you're not in pain, right? And you assured me, no, I just don't have a voice. So, uh, yeah, no, I don't want you to, to blow the rest of your voice on uh, impersonating Chris Farley. That, that's, a, that's a tall order. Yeah, I've got Barry day. White karaoke tonight, so I can't really, you know, yeah, you don't do. want to waste it. All right, very cool. All right, so so you grew up here. Did, do you have any siblings? No human siblings. I have two puppy <laughs> brothers, as I like to call them. Two puppy brothers? Yes. Are you, like, blood-related to them? Or? Um, No, spiritually related to them. Spiritually yeah. related. What, what, are, what are the kind of dogs are we talking about? The least likely dog you think I would have. Um, oh, no. They're little. They're called Bolognese dogs. They're like a Maltese and a Habanese. So they're oh. they're like tiny dog. They weigh like twelve pounds. Well, see now, I always thought, who's got a small dog? Give me a break. All right, come on. This is you know you need a man's dog, right? Well, we were thinking about getting a dog for my oldest daughter, just about the same time that they were shooting a show here. And they were doing something with the SPCA. Mm. And I walked by the green room and I walked right back because this little Chihuahua Beagle mix little girl was staring up at me. I was like, oh, this is the perfect dog for my daughter. I mean, I spend a lot of time with that little puppy. Yeah. I love I now now I can't imagine life without a little lap dog, you yeah. know? So I, I'm with you there. Yeah, they're That's good cool. companions. That's good. That's and they good. don't take up as much bed space as like a lab or a that's the Another thing. Dog. See, I don't know about you, but I go to sleep at night, and Matilda, the little uh, cheagle, mm-hmm. is cuddled up with me, and then the big dog is every night, and I feel so bad for him. Uh, he wants up there, and I'm like, dude, no, it's not happening. not going to happen, bro. It's not This ain't a California king. <laughs> right. It's not happening. So I feel bad for him. Um, but uh, yeah, so you got two of them. What are their names, man? Um, the oldest one is 15, and his name is Leo. Okay. And the youngest one is, he'll be 10 this year, and his name is LB. LB? Yeah. What no, does that stand no for? name. Just LB. Oh, okay. It doesn't mean anything. Just L. It, it can mean anything. That's the thing. Pounds? Anything that, <laughs> anything that L and B could be. It, it kind of. <laughs> Little brother. Yeah. Do that one. And then little person who has no father. Um, oh, little. <laughs> I'm slow, man. 
<laughs> You're good. Okay. Uh, That's a second level joke. Yeah, it is, man. And it's, uh, oof, I'm not capable of those. So you were an only child as far as humans go. Yes. So, so I was too. And I don't know about you, but growing up, I always wanted a brother. Man, I wanted a brother to roughhouse with, you know, play games and stuff, throw the ball with. Uh, were you happy to be an only child or, or did you wish you had siblings? Uh, there's sometimes I wish I had a sibling. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't necessarily a, I need somebody to be around and hang out with. I've always been kind of a, an independent person. Yeah. Some fun times would, would have, you know, it would have been nice to have a sibling around or yeah. somebody closer to my age. Not necessarily, I wouldn't want an older sibling just because I've been like, it's kind of funny on my dad's side of the family. I'm the youngest cousin. But then on my mom's side, I'm the oldest cousin. Oh, wow. So huh. my dad's side, I was the one that every family reunion took the beating, got thrown around, <laughs> got you know beat the, the heck out of. But then on my mom's side, my younger cousin, um, he's 10 years younger, younger than me. Uh-huh. That's the closest boy. So I really couldn't pick on him or anything oh, like yeah. that, you know, like I got picked on. Uh-huh. And until, you know, he got older and then now he's a – he used to. He was an offensive lineman, so you know, oh, nice. it's kind of like, yeah, I can't really mess with you anymore. So you were bottom of the totem pole at uh, the dad's family reunion get-togethers, but you were the one causing trouble when your mom's side of the family. Got oh together. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There okay. was there was many a times at my great grandmother's house, uh, Christmas in Abilene, where uh, one of the cousins would come in crying because <laughs> you know Clay got a little too rough. Oh man, yeah. did you scar anybody? Like physically, uh, scars? I've scarred myself a couple of times <laughs> oh, and all that. But you and me both, man, never inflicted like bloody damage. Just like shoulder might have gotten <laughs> thrown out of the socket oh, no. or something. Well, like I that. mean, how were you in school growing up? Because if you're the only child, you can do no wrong, right? Yeah. And so, how uh, how did that work out? Not for? really. I, I kind of just I had a really weird group of friends. Like I had friends in every kind of group. You know, I had like. Mm-hmm. The skaters, I hung out with those guys, and then I had the football players I hung out with, and then I had theater people. You know, I had my one really good friend that we'd been friends since I was a little kid. Then I had just kind of like friend groups, you know, like I could I could adapt to any kind of situation. Yeah, you were like a utility friend. Yeah. You can hang out with anybody and feel right at home. If you need something, you can call me and I can take care of it. So you mentioned one of those groups that you hung out with, theater friends. Yes. Well, you said earlier, you know, we talked about how you were the mascot, uh-huh. right? So were you in theater? Did you do any acting or anything like no, that? No, I can't mem- remember lines <laughs> to save my life. Okay, well, I wanted to ask. You know, yeah. I hated school growing up. I don't know if, if you were in that category as well. But it sounds like uh, you got along with everybody, so maybe it was a fun place for you to go. Yeah, I mean, it was – in Texas, there's kind of a thing where if you have a letter jacket from the school uh, in a sport uh, or in something that you just – you know, you lettered in. And, you know, when you wear that around, people kind of like, don't yeah. mess with him. Don't. Right. They've got their place. They've earned their place somewhere at this school. So there's no need to pick on them. There's no need to bully them or – or anything, and then the teachers kind of look at that as like you're supposed to be a leader. You know, you're oh. supposed to be somebody who, who doesn't you know let the crowd dictate everything. And, and so you had a letter jacket. I lettered in golf, but I was golf. terrible at it. We just didn't have so a good golf team. Oh, so how did you earn that jacket then? We weren't a good golf team. So you, you were you were I was the good fifth. among a really bad yeah. group. Well, we had like. <laughs> We had mediocre people, but the problem was, is our golf coach, my freshman year, just up and quit. So we had football coaches. <laughs> so freshman year, once a football coach took over, it was basically the upperclassmen or varsity. Everybody else is JV. Well, by the time I got to my sophomore year, there weren't any seniors. So that's awesome. how it was. I was the fifth alternate. That's awesome. So I got to Good go job. to all the varsity tournaments <laughs> and... All you had to do was play in five, and we played eight a year. So I was free like, golf, man. Oh yeah, I played played golf every day for two and a half years. So it was oh good. man, that is awesome! It's funny you made me uh, recall when I was in high school, the golf coach quit or they couldn't find one or something like that, and the wrestling coach had to take over as the golf coach. And he you know, he only did it because he liked the kids and stuff. He was not into golf whatsoever, and this was obvious when he would go out there, and it just so happened that I was in charge of creating a video segment for the golf team for the high school. 
and he, he said, please don't record me. Please don't. Of course I did. The, the one shot that I had, and of course I used it in the segment because it was just too perfect. He hit a shot and it went backwards. Somehow he hit it and it spun backwards. So that was my memory. So it sounds like uh, your high school's golf team was very similar to my high school's golf team, at least as far as the coaches uh, were concerned. Yeah, I mean, we were we were a pretty good group of friends, too. Um, it was just something to do for me. I was like, cool. Yeah. I like to play golf. We'll play golf. Let's do that. And you went to Oklahoma State University. I did. Right. What did you major in when you were up there? Uh, broadcast journalism mm-hmm. and sports media. So right. sports media was a part of the broadcast okay. and journalism school. And you could take like two extra classes and get oh. that added on. <laughs> gotcha. Now you don't deal with sports now. I mean, is that an element of your career that, that you wish you could do? Or Yeah, I've always, I, I went there originally because I wanted to do sports radio, but I just kind of fell out of it. It's fast paced just like this. And I'm a little bit better at the editing and, and post-production side. So I got you. let's stick with that. You and I sound very similar because I wanted to be an NHL announcer when I was growing up. You know, first I was baseball when I was a kid, but when I was in college, I wanted to be an NHL announcer. I wanted to travel with one team. Just pick me one team. And I think I realized there were so many um, Russian names and you got to say them real fast. And I thought, man, I can barely speak a coherent sentence when it's English. So I thought maybe that that's not the best thing to do. But that's cool, man. Was was your time in Oklahoma State memorable? Did you enjoy it there? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, what's it like? What's it like on that campus? Well, it's it's small. It's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, like you have to go out of your way to find Stillwater, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. What I liked about it, it's gotten really big now. Like there's a ton of um, big monster apartment complexes and buildings now all around campus. And when I was there, it was just coming into the prosperity. Boone Pickens had just started giving I was going to say, so T. Boone Pickens donated a lot of money to that yeah, school. Yeah, so we were kind of just starting to get everything going, mm-hmm. and it was nice. I liked that small town feel. Like During the summers, there's only 20,000 people there. Right. And you don't have to worry about there being 30,000 college kids and their parents walking around. These college campuses, I'm sure it's happening in a lot of places, not just Stillwater, not just Lincoln, Nebraska, where I went to school. I went to the University of Nebraska, and there was probably a 15-year gap from when I last visited the college to most recently. And the buildings, you see the old campus, and then you see this ring of modern buildings and new buildings that are so tall, and it's like a whole different world, man. Yeah. These these colleges... Uh, the, a lot of money that gets pumped into those schools. Yeah, the thing I like about Oklahoma State is all the newer buildings on campus, they've tried to keep them with that similar architecture to yeah. everything else. So the only new-looking buildings are these off-campus apartments that they're building all around the fraternity and sorority row. Like, a lot of those houses are getting updated. So we're, it was one-story buildings, and now it's like eight-story buildings uh-huh. all around. You're like, okay. Yeah, the look of a college campus can really change overnight. That's for sure. You talked about your broadcast degree. I haven't heard you mention anything about studying history, which I'm surprised because I asked you, when you were a kid, did you would think you would have this kind of job here, editing video, et cetera, et cetera. But you wanted to be a historian, right? Yeah, I, I grew up, like the History Channel had really come into play. And um, I don't know, I just always loved it. I, I was really fascinated with like World War II history and the different countries involved and why they were involved. And then, you know, also I was really into Texas history. I did the Texas Fort Trail and stuff like that. Have you ever reached out to David Barton? I wonder if maybe he could have you researching stuff. I like the idea of it. Mm-hmm. I like being able to touch the artifacts, see the artifacts, you know, mm-hmm. go and look at like, oh, these are what the uniforms from these different people were and stuff like that. Whenever someone now says anything about Texas history, I think of Phil Collins. Yeah. Because uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but he thought he lived a previous life. Yeah. He thought that he fought at the Alamo. And so he has spent his life now collecting artifacts related to the Alamo in Texas's history. And he recently donated to the state. Yeah. And I just think that is so cool. Is that collection at the Alamo? Do you know anything about like where that's housed? I don't, I don't know. I would assume that they put it somewhere at the Alamo. Yeah. I went to the Alamo a couple of times when I was a kid. It's still a cool place. Yeah, dude. walking around those rooms uh, where they died. Uh, yeah. It's... it's I will say, though, that I, I do enjoy the Riverwalk down there as well. The Alamo, the Riverwalk, it's a good little weekend uh, city there, San Antonio. 
you work here at the Blaze. You've been here for seven years. Was Just it, about, yeah. Yeah. Was it a direct path from college to here? Did you do anything in between? or I started out in West Texas. I went and worked for a uh, local TV station out there once I okay. graduated. I uh, ran all of the video production for the creative services department. Uh-huh. It was a foot in the door type job, you know, entry level, get your foot in, start playing around, learning how to do stuff. And, you know, they took a chance on a kid from college who really didn't have any, you know, background in, in creative services type production. I was there for three years and then uh, applied for this job and got it. So. Perfect. Very cool. Very cool. I also asked you other jobs you've done along the way. One of them that you listed was golf course driving range. Yes. Okay. See, I've worked at a golf course before. Okay. And so you go out there and pick up the balls. Is that, is that part of your that duties? That was part of it, yeah. Part of it, yeah. Okay. One of the, yeah. I didn't get to do it as often as I wanted to, but when I was the guy driving out on the middle of the driving range, I mean, that was a thrill. You know they were aiming at you, especially oh, yeah. the kids. Yeah. You know, I loved being hit by the shots off the practice tee. <laughs> Did you enjoy that as well, or am I just a freak? No, I mean it was because um, <laughs> you knew you felt invincible. You're yeah. driving this cart. You're in a you're in a a cage. It's like you're cage diving with sharks, and you're getting pelted with golf balls coming at you. The course I worked at was a very exclusive private golf course. Mm-hmm. So being a driving range attendant meant more than just picking up balls and mm-hmm. doing. Like we had to sit there and clean the members. Clubs. Yeah, I did that quite a bit. Cleaning yeah. clubs, and you would hope. That they would tip you. No, we couldn't get tipped. Oh, we no. To have tips. Oh, no, man. So <laughs> jumping in the ball cart and going to pick balls, that was something where it was like an escape. Yes, because, because you're, you're alone. Yeah. Well, it, <laughs> generally for us, there was two people on the range at all times, two okay. workers. But the old, whoever the older or the more senior person would always be the one who – determined whether or not they wanted to go pick. If they wanted to go pick and take a break, get in the shade, mm-hmm. put on the iPod and just you know cruise around for an hour or so picking up balls, they would do it. I was driving straight towards the tees, and I didn't even see it. Oh, no. But I like right in the middle of the glass or the, the plexiglass sure. front, just – the loudest thud. I know. I didn't see the ball. I didn't even see the mark that it left. <laughs> but it was the, yes, you're invincible, but you're in a metal cage. Uh-huh. So if something it is loud. hits you're right. it, I'd forgotten like, that, yeah. You kind of like get jolted because you feel like something has actually <laughs> hit the cart because everything starts shaking. Yeah, yeah. And, um, <laughs> you, you hope to see it coming. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've, <laughs> I've had some, I've had some fun out there though. It's, it's always nice, especially, um, you know, if you get a member who was pretty friendly with you that, you know, took the time to know your name and stuff, he'd be like, you know, come over here and hit some balls. Let me, you know, yeah, just hang out, cool. chill out for a minute. Yeah, I got many lessons for free, uh, you know, from members. The worst thing is when, help any. when, like, new members or people who don't play golf come in and then they're, like, asking you questions about their swing and stuff. Uh-huh. And, <laughs> and I'm like, man, I'm a terrible golfer. Yeah. Like, but... We have professionals here. Uh-huh. Like, this is like, there's golf professionals that are trained in this. When I was a kid, I wanted to just drive golf carts. I just, yeah. just love the idea of driving a golf cart. I think all kids do, you know, because it's almost like that that intermediate step to driving a real car. Mm-hmm. That was the most fun aspect of the job for me was just driving the carts, whether it was down the hill to go and wash them or park them or recharge them or whatever. But the most fun, hopefully you got these as well. Sometimes you had assignments where you had to go find a member on the course. You know, we didn't have cell phones stuff like that. You had to find a member on the course. And so you got to take the cart and pass the message along or something like that. But, uh, yeah, so I think there's so many parallels that you and I have uh, uh, with our with our lives. That's wild. But one thing I have not done, which you have on your list of previous jobs, is a call center. Yeah. So you worked at a call center. In college, yeah. I worked at the university's admissions call center. Okay. And basically what that was is, so when, this was not, this wasn't calling to say, "Hey, your car warranty no, is expired." No, this was <laughs> this was people who reached out to us and actually asked for more information. Okay, well that's that's at events that's cool. or anything like yeah. that. So we would call them and and try to talk to them, see what they're they're doing, and they have any questions about the application process, like what ACT scores they need to you know get for certain scholarships, and you know when they need to have those in by, and and 
Just some basic. All right. So this wasn't unsolicited stuff because when I see no, call that's center, what, yeah, that's what most people thought. Like when I said call center, but I was like, no, they actually wanted us to call them. Because I was going to ask you, what's the what's the harshest thing you've been told to do when you've called? But obviously, it's a different situation here. Yeah, I know you work hard and you stay up here quite a bit during the week. Yeah, um, but. Do you get a lot of free time? And if so, like, what are your hobbies? What do you do, man? It's funny. I, I'm up here during my free time. <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of. I'm but, afraid uh, you're going to say but that. But it's not, it's not to work here. It, it's nice because we have a full wood shop in the back. We have yeah. all the tools you can need to build anything. And I kind of like to play around with stuff and, and try to make something out of nothing. Or I see something online or a video and I just like, oh, let me act. I can make that. Oh, cool. And so, you know, I'll just come up here on the weekend for an hour or two and, and just kind of play around with stuff and see if I can't make something work. Or So would I, you consider that a talent? Because you told me, oh, I don't have any special talents or whatever. I don't know. Being able to carve something from wood sounds like a talent to me. I don't really consider it a talent. It's just kind of a skill. Hmm. It's more of a skill set. Mm-hmm. What's, the, what's the most intense thing you've ever built? Because I will say... That on Pat and Stu, and it took me a while to believe you because I didn't know anything about you. Yeah. Uh, for Pat and Stu, you built the like a spoon statue, right? For Jeff, yeah, the the spoon of uh, spoon of thrones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was for a bunch of spoons. Of spoons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Where is that thing right now? Uh, I think they gave it away to what? some uh, like some super fans that like went to the Mercury One auction and uh-huh. bid and won a day with Pat and Stu. And it was like one of their last shows that they did. And, oh, man. Um, yeah, that was a sad time because I put a lot of effort into no that. No kidding. That was, thing was fabulous. And so yeah. when, when I was talking to you about it, I was like, yeah, I made this. I said, shut up. Yeah. No, you didn't. And then I realized eventually, wait, he actually did. Is that your, I don't know, your Mona Lisa? Or is there something else that, that you're proud of that hopefully hasn't been just given away? <laughs> I don't know. I've I've made... A bunch of random stuff. I think the my most favorite so far or recently is my mom's always wanted um, a wooden Christmas tree, which is basically planks of wood stacked up on a metal bar or some kind of center piece, and that you can kind of spin and make. Okay, yeah, I yeah, you. you've seen them. Yep. Um, and so she's been asking me for three years. All she's ever wanted is one, and I never. I was like, I don't. <laughs> it takes so much time. Like, is and, there a how-to video for that, Clayton? No, there's <laughs> there's a guess on how how many boards you're gonna need, uh-huh. and then you know a hope that you cut them the right length, and then drill a bunch of holes in the middle of them, and then stack them each individually on a metal pipe and Man. jam it into the ground. So I made her one for I made her one in like a day. I just said I just got mad and just said you know what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna build something i need to i need to here's your christmas tree mom well no i wasn't necessarily mad at her i was just like just wasn't in a good mood and coming up here and like tinkering is is a good way to just kind of take yeah. your mind off stuff because you really got to pay attention to what you're doing and it's a quiet place on the weekends so. oh it's it's <laughs> super nice it's super nice up here uh, i enjoy I would I would prefer if I could work from the hours of like 9 p.m. to like 4 a.m. Oh wow! Or like <laughs> sometimes because sometimes when I have so much stuff to do, it's just like I would prefer to not have anyone here. Yeah, <laughs> that's like no, I, that's why I come up here quite a bit on the weekends to prep for the Monday show. Yeah, it's uh, it's very quiet. Yeah, it's so nice. I can totally understand the appeal. So you put down one of your hobbies is to play poker are you like a poker champion have you entered tournaments or you just enjoy playing i just like playing there's a amateur hold'em league is Mm -hmm. what it's called in in this neck of the woods and it's it's free to play and and it's just kind of like show up on you know they have a game every tournament every day pretty much and you just show up and you know there's 30 to 40 people and you just play poker and most of them are about a hundred dollar cash prize that the bar pays, but you don't pay anything to get in. That's how it's legal. So I just started doing that just because I used to play a lot when I was in high school and college and liked it. Have you ever played poker at a casino or anything like mm-hmm. that? Or no? Okay. no, that's one of my goals this year is to go up and, and play. Yeah. Check it out. So leather work, what, what does that entail? That's one of your hobbies. What's, what's Mostly, the coolest thing you've made leather-wise? Um, and does it rival the Throne of Spoons? I don't know if anything can rival that. Right. 
Um, if you're listening to this and you have the Clayton Kimbrough throne of spoons, can you just can you just let him know it's okay? Maybe <laughs> take a picture of it, uh, tweet it. Uh, it might not have made it back through uh, oh, secure gosh. TSA. It's probably in the back of DFW Airport yeah. uh, with a bunch of lost luggage. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, mm. I've made a bunch of stuff out of leather. I've I've done like painting on leather where you stencil something out with a knife cut it in and uh-huh. and uh do the leather working on it uh bezel it and put the detail on it and then you just kind of paint it i've built my own wallet out of it like the wallet i have right now i, I made myself mm, that's cool yeah you can then, make it exactly how you want it to be huh? oh yeah yeah i you know <laughs> just and that's what leather is the same thing as wood i just kind of look for something online that might be a little simple to build. Build that once and then kind of see how it works, and then mm-hmm. I'll kind of modify it to what I need it to be, and then I'll go from there. But I, um, I've done a bunch of little things here or there. I like I started out making the uh, the little valet trays, like that you put your keys and your change in, okay. and those are super easy. And then I just started learning how to do leather work out of that. I've made one gun holster. And do you sell any of this stuff? No. Nah. It's, I you just make it for so, yourself. I just make it to make it. I mean, if you get enough things, you know, created, maybe you could go to like a farmer's market or something like that. And yeah, my mom keeps telling me I need to sell these Christmas trees, and I'm just like, how long did it take you to make that one? Five hours. That was a seven foot tall one, though. How much would you sell it for if you uh, if Probably you like give the mom a discount? Four hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, it cost about one hundred and twenty to make, and then you wow. got to take my time into it. Yeah, mom got a deal. Like free, right? Yeah. You didn't charge mom. You know, before we got started, you're playing music on your phone. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, it was a rap song. Yes. You know, is that your favorite genre of music or what is the, what, is, what, what do you listen to these days? I listen to everything. Um, I mostly listen to podcasts and stuff, but you know, I, I grew up listening to the radio and, and all kinds of stuff from pop songs and stuff like that. Texas country. I learned a lot about that in college because my roommate was really into it. And then um, classic rock was always a major, major player. What's the what's the last song you played on repeat? Um, <laughs> I think it was. Hey man, I gotta hear this song again. I'm gonna I'm gonna play this one back because uh, I don't I gotta, know. Let me look on. Let me yeah, look check on my your, Spotify. Uh, check your check uh, your your listen history. And so this is gonna be this is kind of a weird one because it goes back to what you just. <laughs> He's asked being me completely before. honest. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> so I don't know why, but I've really always liked this rapper named Juice World, and okay. he just died. Oh. So like, I just kind of started going back through his catalog, and uh, he has this song. It's I think it's called Shadows. Okay, and it's pretty pretty good. It's, so, so is this a, a recommended song from Clayton? Shadows. It's kind of like emo rap. Oh wow, Shadows so, by Juice World. Yeah, it's it's kind of. I'll check it out. I want. I've already written it down. Thank you. Uh, I can't wait to report back to you. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a little it's a little weird. It's a crazy genre, but I mean, I grew up when emo was like Dashboard Confessional and wow, all these all these bands were coming out. Like yeah, how Hawthorne old are you? Heights. I'm 31. Okay. What year does that put you born? In? 88. 88? Okay, yeah. So I'm a little bit older than you. <laughs> Just a hair. Yeah, I'll check out Juice World. Yeah, what, what are some of your favorite bands then? Some other things I need to check out. Because I'm always looking for new music, you know. Okay, well then let's let's play games. Because I, I have enjoyed Dashboard Confessional in the past, so that's a lot closer to my wheelhouse than, and I don't know this for a fact, I presume uh, Juice World will be. Oh yeah, you're going you're gonna to be a big time Juice World. Oh, I can't I wait. Just, oh, my God. This is going to be good. So <laughs> this guy, that he's a local guy, too, and he's really good. His name's Joshua Ray Walker. Joshua Ray Walker. Yeah, okay. he's kind of a, a old-school kind of honky-tonk country singer. Ooh, I'm probably going to be hanging out with Juice World instead, but go yeah. ahead. Um, well, see, that's that's my thing. I like... You're all over the map. I'm all over You're the map. You're unpredictable. Yeah. Uh, there's a guy named Tyler Childers that I really like. He's kind of uh, bluegrass. Mm. Um, then there's a Juice, punk- Juice World's looking better and better to me <laughs> right now, just to let you know. Then there's a, a Irish punk band named Fontaine's DC that's in there. 
And then I have Bring Me the Horizon, which is metal, Sleigh Bells, which is kind of electro pop metal. And then I have The Best of the Five Stair Steps. Okay. That's a completely random Very one. Cool. And then St. Paul and the Broken Bones, stuff like that. It's, yeah. it's all, it's, that's literally the seven playlists I have on my iPhone. What this is right now, this is you are playing the role of me telling Pat, uh, Pat Gray of Pat Gray Unleashed, um, what I listen to. I don't recognize anything. But I'll check some of these out. Yeah. I wrote quite a bit of those down. All right. So one of your big goals in your life is to own a ranch. Yes. In South Texas. Uh, it should tell be me, every Texan's goal. <laughs> tell me more. Why a ranch and why South Texas? Two years ago, my birthday present was a hunting trip to South Texas. Okay. With the... To hunt what? Uh, it was just an exotic animal. Oh, hunt. wow. Okay. Yeah. So it was whatever, whatever was available. And it was with... Um, Ty Detmer, who played for BYU. <laughs> nice. So he has a ranch down there. Okay. And just through, you know, his family, a guy who works for my stepdad's company is a salesman for him. He's related to Ty. Um, so we got down there, and I, I got to go hunt for a weekend. And I don't know. I just I just really like the idea of having a bunch of land with just really cool, crazy animals on it. and. Mm-hmm. You know, every now and then have somebody pay a lot of money to come shoot one of them. And then, <laughs> How many acres do you want this uh, South Texas ranch it'd be to nice be? nice to have about 500. Yeah. Wow. And then fun. just live on about 30 of it and then just... So you want to live on the ranch. You don't want to just oh, own yeah. it. You want to live... I want to live there. You want to live the lifestyle. I like being in the middle of nowhere. Game ranch, yeah. not a cow ranch. I, I don't know. I just... I've always loved that. That's what my... I, I moved to the city, but I should have lived in the country. I feel like, you know, like... I. My dad lived out there, so anytime I went and visited him, it was kind of like, you know, put on the blue jeans and boots and go to work and, you know, kind of live that country yeah. life every other weekend. So it was it was always something I wanted to do and always something I really kind of wished I did, had done more growing up. Uh-huh. And um, I like the idea of owning something I can look at, like owning a stock in something. Like, I can't look at that. Yeah. But like owning land, I can look at that. You know, I can yeah. see it. And see, my kids, and, and me too, I mean, as an adult, but my kids were, were blessed to, on multiple occasions, we went down to a, uh, this guy I was friends with in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And we reconnected when I moved here because I knew he was out here in Texas. It turned out he was a couple of hours away running a ranch for a family. And so every summer, the family and I would go down there and it was so much fun. And really the only game um, that we would hunt would be, and we never got anything, but we'd always keep an eye out for wild boars, you know, mm-hmm. to see yeah. if they're out there. That's very appealing. Uh, I can totally understand that because you're out in the country. And this world is so crazy and so loud. Having a place to escape like that is absolutely uh, appealing. Yeah, that's the whole point of it is just, you know, have somewhere where and get some sanity you can get back. the heck away from everything. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So I asked you, I don't think you have a bucket list, right? Uh, do you have anything you want to accomplish, anything in your life that uh, you're like, hey, I want to travel here or I want to see this or... I don't know. I don't really like set goals or, you know, I don't believe in New Year's resolutions. I just believe you should try to be better every day. (laughs) You know, like just try to make something about your life better than the day it was before, you know, Mm -hmm. and just kind of be in touch with like what you're actually doing. And I I think in doing that, you just, you know, opportunities come to do stuff. You know, your your attitude makes a lot of uh, your environment. So... Something comes along, it sounds cool. All right, let's do it. One thing you had mentioned to me, I should have asked you this earlier. I kind of want to know what your earliest childhood memory is because you told me earlier before we started rolling that you were an early walker. Early you, walker. You started walking early. How old were you when you started walking? Like, I have no average? idea, Keith. That's I was just saying age. words. Oh, I thought that was a thing. All right, so you weren't so you weren't an early walker. You lied to me. I gotcha. don't know when I started walk, okay. walking. Okay, I don't your, remember anything before. I, I didn't was expect like you to three. remember. I thought maybe your mom had enlightened you over the years. No, the first memory I have. Yeah, what is was a being pulled in a wagon by my grandfather when we first moved to Arlington uh-huh. to a playground that was right down the street from his house. That's the first thing I remember is that, and then a light bright. I remember. Oh, a light, light brights. Bright. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yeah, we had a light, I had a light bright, and I just jammed on that thing all the time. I was all about the light bright. I swear, man, every kid I knew, not named Keith, had a light bright. Yeah. And then I think somehow I got one at a yard sale or something, and by then, you know, 
the magic was done and oh, you know yeah. they had already moved on and stuff and i think like it only halfway worked or something like half the half of the thing would light up and yeah. stuff it was really depressing but uh, thanks for bringing me bringing me down sorry by bringing sorry to ruin your you know bring up your ruined childhood because you didn't have a five dollar light yeah i should have uh should have saved up and got one on my own instead of waiting for mom and dad to do that for me, huh? Yeah, make your own destiny, Keith. That's right. That's right. I, I should have. I should have done that. Well, I want to thank you. I mean, a letterman in golf from MacArthur High School in Irving, Texas. It's terrible not, at golf. It's not every day you get to. Hang oh out yeah, with I'm so like proud. I'm so proud of that leather jacket. Be. Oh my god. Well, thank you, Clayton Kimbrough. Thanks for spending time, man. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Yes, sir. This has been at the mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. Look for At The Mike Show on Twitter to connect.